the newest weekday voice on Channel 110. This is the Maggie Linton Show on Sirius XM Urban View. Well, welcome back. I was telling my uh, producer, I said, I've been on a month now. I'm not that new. We're going to have to get that changed. Uh, how many of you know about long-term health care? And what do you know? And how many of you also know that there is a long-term care commission? Well, we're going to learn about that plus a whole lot more from Chris Arrestus. He's senior health care expert on Obamacare. He is also CEO of Life Care Funding. Thanks so much for joining me, Chris. I don't Whoops. hear Chris. Oh, hello, oh, Chris. Oh. Yeah, now we For got you. For a second, you. I yeah. thought I got dropped. I'm no, glad, no, glad we got on. you on. Okay. It's okay. No problem. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, your background because that's pretty interesting within itself. Sure. You know, I actually spent a number of years in Washington, D.C., where I worked as a lobbyist for the insurance industry and watched um, – you know, the, the progression of what's happened to the point where we are today with seniors that are living longer and the cost of long-term care is getting much more expensive. We're now at a point where we have 10,000 baby boomers a day who are turning 65. And that's a, just a huge addition to the population of people that qualify for Medicare and Social Security and cost the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money when it comes to supporting them for long-term care expenses. And when we look at long-term care, I know Congress, which I call the do-nothing Congress, uh, has been uh, trying to uh, raid part of Social Security, take it also to um, uh, private sector, that type of thing. And uh, way too many of us, and I'll raise my hand closer to retirement than I am to anything else, uh, really uh, need to realize that we do have a few other sources for uh, long-term health care. That's right. You know, long-term care of any form, whether it's home care, assisted living, nursing home care, whatever it may be, it's a very expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. And so few people in this country at any age prepare for it, even understand the differences between the types of care or what Medicare would pay for, what Medicaid would pay for, what has to be paid for by private funds. Uh, and that's a big reason why the Long-Term Care Commission that met in Washington just a few weeks ago, uh, a big, big session that basically came out with two big outcomes. One was Medicare and Medicaid is not going to be able to afford to keep up with 10,000 baby boomers a day turning 65, seniors living longer, the cost of care getting more expensive, and that there was going to be a need for the private sector. Private market innovations were going to have to come forward and, and find other ways to help people pay for care and be prepared to handle those expenses. And when we uh, look at the at the commission, uh, are they going to continue to meet in order to help deal with some of these issues? You know, it's a it's a temporary commission. Mm -hmm. It's a bipartisan group that was appointed by by uh, uh, by members of Congress, the president for both sides of the aisle, experts that 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 d deal with senior care, senior care finance, Medicare, Medicaid. It it's going to meet and provide its final report before the end of the year. So it's a short-term body with a very big assignment dealing with one of the biggest financial problems that this country is confronting today. One, I mean, what's driving the budget deficit and, and, and our financial problems really are entitlements. It's the cost of keeping up with Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Those are three of the biggest things that cost not only the federal government, but in, in, in every state that has to also bear a portion of the Medicaid cost. That is one of the biggest budget items in every state and states are struggling with keeping up with those expenses as well. Yes, definitely. And we see so many, um, I, as I look toward, where I live in Maryland, and a lot of money has now come in through casinos, but that's still not going to solve the problem. No, you know, th th those things, casinos, lotteries, you know, sin taxes, mm -hmm. those are all band-aids. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem is, how do you 
turn around the environment where Medicaid in particular is the biggest funder of long-term care services in this country, and you have the smallest percentage of people who are on Medicaid are consuming the largest percentage of the dollars because it's being spent on long-term care. They're in nursing homes uh, and, and other care environments that are very expensive. Now, one of those private market solutions is something that our company specializes in, and that's what we focus on, life care funding. We've been in business since 2007, and what we do is we work with seniors who have a life insurance policy, and instead of them abandoning the policy, we help them convert it into a long-term care benefit that they can then use to pay for any type of care that they want. Uh, that's what we were going to talk about next. And and so let's just uh, uh, go right to it. Once again, if you have uh, questions or comments, I know you probably have some questions for Chris because I sure can't answer a lot of them. The number is 866-801-8255. Once again, that's 866-801-TALK. Uh, let's talk about the converting of insurance policies because that's something that's been out there for a long time, but a lot of people just don't know about it because all we hear is about, you know, Know, make sure you have Part B paid for, which is your long-term care insurance. Right, right, right. This is this is an alternative, particularly that that will help a large percentage of of the senior population, <clears throat> because so many people still have life insurance policies. Families that bought life insurance years ago, when when their children were young, as now that they've grown up, and their the parents are seniors looking at long term care, too many of them will actually just walk away from a life insurance policy after paying premiums, sometimes for decades. Mm-hmm. They'll just either abandon it, no longer pay the premiums, or there might be a little bit of cash surrender value, so they'll take that. Um, and let the policy go. Well, for the insurance company, that's that's a big that's a big boom because they've collected premiums for years, and now they're not going to have to pay a death benefit. Seniors and, and and policy owners in general just don't know that owning a life insurance policy is actually your personal property. It's an asset. You own it and have control of it, like just like a home, a car, a stock portfolio. It's your asset, and you have the legal right to convert the death benefit and take the present day value some some lesser amount than the than the full death benefit but a present day value and then turn that into a private, protected, long-term care benefit account that'll pay for any form of care you want. All right. We're going to, we've got a call from James in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, please, James. Yeah. Yes, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, I was listening to, you know, turn in and listen to this thing about entitlement. And what disturbs me is that um, the baby boomers, they pay well into these entitlement programs. And now we're hearing that it's not um, sustainable. And we know that over the decades that Congress has been borrowing against all of these entitlement programs, and now they want us to repay for something we already paid into. And I don't think that's fair. You know, you're looking for a new paradigm for us to pay for something that we always pay forward to. I'm 47. I'm way um, away from... um, Social Security, but y'all telling me that after, um, by the time I reach 65, it's not going to be there for me. So my question is, why are you not looking at um, turning um, turning the, um, the the program or having a program in which, um, depending on how much you make, like all these folks that pay into it, that's millionaires or um, that has that has reached the status. We still paying out um, Social Security to them. Why are we not looking at making um, giving giving them a tax break more so than paying that money out? Well, I I would just say this: there 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 are certainly a number of proposals on the table that are being looked at to how do you extend Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and their ability to to meet the promise of people who have paid into it. But just like pension plans all over all, all over the country that that are unfunded, the problem is, you know, when the money goes in, it doesn't go in into a an account that's marked with your, your name, name on and it. And the money is waiting for you. It's being spent today on people's needs today. And and as the as the as more people become 
seniors and more people retire and there's less tax base and less people working to support that, you start to reach an impossible proposition that requires private market innovation to come forward, which, quite frankly, is the hallmark of the American way. I mean, whenever there's a crisis, the private market steps forward and helps to solve that crisis with innovation. What we talk about is people who have paid into a life insurance policy for years, and instead of letting that go and getting nothing in return, taking the full value present day of that asset and applying it towards those long-term care costs so that for seniors, they can keep themselves off of Medicaid. Because let me tell you something, you don't want to be on Medicaid. Because if you're on Medicaid, that means you're below the poverty line, you're a ward of the state, and Medicaid's going to tell you what form of care you're going to get and where you're going to go get it. If you're private pay, then you're in charge, you're in control, you're making those decisions, and, and that's where people want to be. Agree with that because um, I think under anything under private, first of all, private um, private company has gotten us into where we at today. From Wall Street to every company that have made millions and laid off hundreds of thousands of American citizens, and then went off and took their product, their industry, and their jobs overseas. We cannot depend on private companies. Depending on private companies actually strangles us because we no longer have control of costs. So I don't believe in that. When it comes to the pension plans, most of the uh, Pennsylvania um, particularly, Pennsylvania had not paid in to their pension plan for over 10 years because when the market was good, the, um, the unions allowed them to defer the payments. Now, when the market got bad, um, the the government said, oh, it's unsustainable. So they tried to not pay that. So basically, here we are the same, depending on the government, you know what I mean, to go off and keep their, their, um, keep their promises. And we, as average, average citizens, I've been working for 27 years, and you're saying that I have to pay more into my pension plan because you did not pay your fair share. Sir, he didn't say you necessarily had to pay more into your pension plan. What he's saying is have insurance. And yeah. insurance is something that everyone pretty much should have anyway. Not necessarily just general health insurance, but uh, long-term care uh, or general uh, insurance. Uh, right. And that is what you can use as an asset to take care of you in the long-term way. Right. What we, what, we, what we are always emphasizing to, to families, and we're talking to families across the country every day that we're helping them work through how are they going to pay for long-term care, what's the mm -hmm. best form of long-term care for them. What we see is so few families prepare themselves, as you just said. They're, they're, they're not doing their homework. They're not, you know, it's not that they don't want to, but it's difficult to save. We live, you know, we live in expensive times. They're trying to put kids through college. And, and the, the cost of, of sustaining yourself in a, in a nursing home for a year can be in, in, in the range of $100,000 a year. I was going to say more than sending your kid to college. Right, yes. right, right. And yeah. too few people have prepared themselves, not because they didn't want to, but many just didn't know or, or were unable to. And so what we're trying to let people know is, is that it's not a hopeless situation. You don't have to just rely on the government to come in and, and take care of you. There are situations where if you have an asset such as a life insurance policy, although the insurance companies aren't out there educating people about this because it's not necessarily in the insurance company's best interest, but in the interest of the individual who owns a policy, they shouldn't be throwing those policies away, and they do by the billions every year. They should instead be converting those into a long-term care benefit. It's another way to be prepared and use an asset you've already bought into, you already own. Okay, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Curtis in Atlanta. Go ahead, Curtis. Good morning. Good morning. What kind of rubs me the wrong way when I hear that term entitlement? You know, Jimmy Carter, when he was president, didn't want to leave office in a 
deficit. So I don't know how old you are, my man, but he went to the American people on TV and borrowed $488 billion from Social Security, and the Congress voted for it. After he did it, Reagan came in and spent the rest. Now they rolled it over into the general fund. So when you say the United States don't have enough money to pay for Social Security, the government spent our Social Security money, $2 trillion, and now they give you a check, and now because less people are working, working they want to change the rules, turn it over to the CPI. Obama wants to do that. It's just wrong. These, You know, I just can't understand how you come with these talking points and just everybody starts saying the same word. It says federal contribution Federal Federal Insurance Contribution Act. I never saw the word entitlement on a Social Security check that I pay in. Secondly, these entertainers, they can do one concert paying the Social Security for a lifetime. Never have to pay it to it, into it again. And the rich get richer and the poor get poor. If the rich would pay their full share like Apple, Facebook owners, and all these other hedge funds paying the Social Security, it wouldn't be broke. But you guys keep coming with that entitlement word. You need to well, you know, it. you know, the word entitlement doesn't mean that it's a it's a handout or charity. What the word entitlement means is your right. And at the and when you turn the age of sixty five, it is your right to automatically qualify for Medicare and Social Security. Medicaid's a little different. It's a program designed to to support the poor, the disabled, and and children. Um, but what happened is Medicaid and actually ended up becoming the default payer of long-term care services in the United States. And the way people get on to Medicaid to be for it to cover their their senior care, and this is really what happens with a lot of middle-class Americans, is they will what's do what's known as spend down their assets. They will impoverish themselves to get below the poverty line. Solid, middle, upper middle class Americans with, with plenty of assets, uh, not enough to just sustain themselves indefinitely in a long term care scenario, but certainly not people who you would meet and think that is a person who lives below the poverty line. Yet they will spend themselves down to get below poverty and go on to Medicaid to cover their long term care. What we're trying to do is help people avoid having to put themselves in that position. Uh, Certainly, Medicare, Social Security, every American. Bill Gates, he, he will get Medicare and Social Security, and, and so will your neighbor when they turn 65. That is an entitlement. They are entitled to that. That is their right. Medicaid is something that, that people who become put themselves in a position of becoming a ward of the state then get their long-term care covered. We're trying to help people avoid putting themselves in that position. All right, we're going to have to take a break. Uh, thank you, Curtis, for calling. Uh, and if you want to hang on, that's fine with other comments. But we've got to take a break right now and continue when we come back with Chris Orestes. He's senior health care expert and is CEO of Life Care Funding. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Maggie Linton Show on Sirius XM Urban View. We'll be right back. And now, let's join Maggie Linton on Sirius XM Urban View, Channel 110. Welcome back. We continue now with Chris Aristus. He is senior health care expert and CEO of Life Care Funding. Uh, Chris, before we're going to go right to the next call. It's Doug from Chicago, and he's got a question about uh, life insurance and health. Go ahead, Doug. Sure. I came. I started this show just a little bit late. That's okay. I have, I have a whole life policy as well as long-term care insurance. Now, if I, if I understand it correctly, if you just have whole, a whole life policy that builds value, you can use that towards your uh, health care when you get older? You know, any actually, Doug, any form of life insurance will qualify. Your whole life policy could very well, and, it, and it's not a matter of what you may have in that policy for cash value. It's really a, a factor of the death benefit and converting some percentage, which could be as high as 60% or, or greater of the death benefit could be converted 
into a long-term care benefit plan. And then a lot of people, what they'll do for those that have a long-term care insurance policy as well as a life insurance policy, they'll combine the two. So they have the coverage of the long-term care insurance policy, and then they have the the policy, the life insurance policy conversion benefit that they use to fill in the gaps and have additional money to spend so they can really, you know, go into a high-end assisted living community, home health care, um, you know, whatever it is that they want to choose. When you're a private pay, you can choose any form of care you want. And with life insurance, you can convert any type of life insurance, whether it's term life, whole life, universal life, group life, any type of life insurance will qualify. So you're in a really good position with those two policies. Fantastic. Now, this and, and um, that wording would be in, in my policy. Basically, I can look through my policy and find that long term care conversion uh, literature or like. <laughs> No, actually, no. Generally, actually, not. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to find that in your policy. What where you're going to find it is is in the private market. That's where companies like what what we do, life care funding, and you'll find information about it on our website, lifecarefunding.com. Um, that is a private market conversion. In essence, what you're going to do is you're going to trade in the policy and the death benefit to get a living benefit in the form of this long-term care benefit account. It's an irrevocable FDIC insured account. The money that you would get out of trading in your life insurance policy goes into that account and then is used to, on a monthly basis to spend directly towards your care. Fantastic. You guys make me feel good about my future. Yeah, well, Thanks. I was going to say the thing is, is you just keep paying and, and you're going to come out so much further ahead. But do what you're doing right now and continue that and you'll come out the better for it. Absolutely. Okay, that is somebody much. who's well prepared. You're well yes. prepared, Doug. Thank you very much. Have All right. Day, thank you, Doug. Uh, you know, when he said, is it on my policy? That's one of the the problems, hasn't it been, uh, Chris, is the fact that the insurance companies haven't wanted to tell people. That's right. We've actually gone out and we've been fighting this fight. That's why we're looked at as senior care advocates. We've been out around the country. We've testified at, at state legislatures. We've helped champion actually legislation across the country to make sure that consumers are being informed of their legal right. You're not going to find this in your life insurance policy. You you, you need to find this out there in the market where, where this option is available to you. And, and it means you have to be informed. You have to go out and look for this information. Uh, states have started passing laws to make sure consumers are being informed of it. Texas was the first state in the country to actually pass a law that says that their Medicaid department has to inform anybody looking at Medicaid that if they have a life insurance policy, they have the right to convert it, and they can delay having to go on to Medicaid by staying private pay and choosing the form of care they want. Now, what happens to that? Um, well, I guess it would be Part, if, if you should pass away before you finish using it, though, does it go on to the family kind of like with an estate or or something along those lines? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question, Maggie. Let's say, let's say it were a $100,000 policy for round numbers and, and, and you got $60,000 of benefit. Okay. In essence, you would have traded in, and, and in essence, really, you're selling off the life insurance policy, the $100,000 death benefit, to get $60,000 today. It's going into that private irrevocable FDIC insured account. Uh, and, and if you were to pass away before you had spent through all of the 60000 let's say half of it were still sitting there, $30,000, that would go right to your family. In addition, there's always a funeral benefit that's held in those accounts so that if you outlive the benefit, one, that would mean if you did need to, you could go on to Medicaid because you would have spent through it all and you can, you'd can you still be Medicaid eligible. And there's a funeral benefit that will help as well. Either way, you're guaranteed to get the full benefit amount either over the monthly payments or anything that's left over goes to your family. All right. We have a call from Monica in Ohio. Go ahead, please, Monica. Hi. Hello, Maggie. How are you? Good. And you? I'm great. Thank you. I really enjoy your show. And hello to your guests. My question is... At what age should you consider purchasing long-term care insurance? You know, long-term care insurance, um, you probably want to, well, it's a simple answer, and this is 
earlier and the younger you purchase it, the, the cheaper less expensive it is. It's going to be. <laughs> That's you know? true. So, I mean, I literally, you know, you, you know, there's always like that one person you know who's just really well prepared and 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 super organized and bought a long-term care insurance policy in their 20s. But but you know, for the most part, people tend to start looking at buying these policies in their 40s, their 50s, while you're still relatively young and healthy. That's going to get you better rates than if you were to try and buy it in your 70s or 80s. You know, buying a long-term care insurance policy is sort of like buying homeowners or, or, or car insurance, you know, you can't wait until you're in your 80s and getting ready to move into a nursing home to buy long-term care insurance, just like you can't crash your car and then go buy car insurance to cover the accident. You have to be prepared in advance. Okay. And then what about for aging parents who are already at the, in the 70s, like at the 75 mark, who don't have, who have not made that purchase already? How would I, as a child, go about, um, or the person who's going to be caring for them, go about, uh, is, it, is it too late to purchase for them or, or where are we at on that? You know, I would look at a couple of things. One, I would see, do they currently have life insurance? Because if they do, you want to make sure you're hanging on to those life insurance policies because you're going to be able to convert it into, into a benefit. Um, second, depending on their, their, their health, you know, it's not impossible to, to be able to buy a long-term care insurance policy or a life insurance policy when you're in your 60s and your 70s. It's all based on your health. You know, you could be a very healthy non-smoker, non-drinker, you know, exercising in your 70s and still qualify for, for a relatively fair rate for life insurance or long-term care insurance. First thing you want to do, if you have life insurance, hang on to it. Second thing you want to do is is take a look and see, is there still the possibility that you could buy either life insurance or long-term care insurance? Because either one can be used to then help you pay for long-term care. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. And I was going to say, say, say one thing here. Uh, you might check the AARP website because they're pretty much good about at least what you might be able to do at a certain age, especially if you're over 50. Okay, That's, great. It's a great point. It's, yeah. a great, it's a great it's a great source resource. for a lot of uh, information, in particular about insurance. And also uh, Chris's insurance, uh, lifecarefunding.com. I'm not sure insurance, but uh, we- his website is also extremely good. Okay? Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for the information. This is You're welcome. Topic. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, once again, we're talking with uh, Chris Aristus. He is senior health care expert and CEO of Life Care Funding. Uh, C- Chris, a, a good point, like the lady said, about buying it early. I know when I started buying mine, uh, it was I was I was about forty to fifty dollars a month for the long term care because I learned because of my parents, um, and, you know, and the the Medicare uh, or Medicaid uh, B. Part B of your Social Security being the long term also, but right. it has gone up a little bit, but still nothing that I can handle. It's way under a hundred bucks, and I'm I'm over sixty. It's way under a hundred bucks uh, per year. I mean. Uh, for that per month for that. So it's well worth it to look into it at any age if you can. I, I absolutely couldn't agree more. Um, the only thing I would also say is is you just want to make sure you understand who you're buying the policy from mm-hmm. and and what it does cover. We do right. see scenarios where somebody with a long-term care insurance policy assumes that they can get home care or, or assisted living and then they find out that the policy they bought doesn't allow for it <sighs> or that there's, you know, or that there's a limit to the amount of care that they can get and so they're coming up short. You just want to really make don't just assume all long-term care insurance policies are the same. There's so many different variations. And, and of course, you know, the more benefit and the more the more uh, liberal it is, the more expensive it's going to be. Also, make sure you know what company you're working with. In, in just the last two or three years, some of the big long-term care insurance companies have quit the market. Mm-hmm. MetLife uh, no longer, Prudential no longer, Unum no longer sells long-term care insurance. And it's a shrinking market. Uh, there's there's really, you know, I remember 10 years ago, there was a hundred or more long-term care insurance companies. Today, there's about a dozen, less than 20 left in the business. Yeah. So you need to know your market before you purchase the product. Very true. We have James in Atlantic City. Go ahead, James. Yes, I was asking the question on, um, listen, I really have a policy for long-term care with Unum since you brought that question up. Can I uh, keep that policy? I'm still paying into it. And how does it benefit me? Uh, I don't really understand it. Your long-term care insurance policy? Yes, I have a long-term care policy that I've taken out years ago. 
Yeah, I, I would make sure it's in force and continue to pay those premiums. You don't want to let – if you own a long-term care insurance policy, you don't want to let it go. It, it, it will help okay. you. It may, not, it, may not give, it may not give you 100% coverage for anything and everything you want, but it's going to be a good start at least. And so hang on to that policy. Keep paying now, the premiums. Take a look at the policy and read it or, or, or actually contact you know, a long-term care insurance agent and have them walk you through. What is this policy that I own? And, and and what more potentially could I do if this is not everything that I think that I need? I got you. I got you. Okay. And how do I go about if I wanted to convert a, a portion of my life insurance policy to long-term care? Can I still do that? And how do I go online to find out that information? Yes. If you own a life insurance policy, and, and, and the conversion that we're talking about really is for people who need the care now, that's okay. sort of an immediate need scenario. What you want to do is, is as I said, understand your long-term care insurance policy. What, it, what, you know, what is that that you own? Look at your life insurance policy. Make sure you keep it in force because – you know, right now, you're getting the benefit of that death benefit. If something were to happen to you, your beneficiary is going to get that full death benefit tax-free. But right. as you get older and you get to the point where you need long-term care and you're trying to figure out how to make all the numbers work, you might be able to, at that point, take the policy. And it's a very quick process. It, it, it actually – there's no fees associated with it. It takes about 30 to 45 days. You convert the death benefit, a portion of it, into the long-term care benefit, and then it starts making the payments every month. And you can combine that with the long-term care insurance benefits. So you'd have the, 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 the dual coverage, in essence. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, and, and once you convert it, uh, do, are you, can you still get interest on that money? Uh, yeah, you can put it into it. It can go into an interest-bearing account, but but what we see is that the you know it's not that those benefit accounts last for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Usually, they're they're going to last for months to a year or two, so the interest is 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 a minimal consideration. Uh, really, what you want is to get the most conversion value of the death benefit, and then put it in a position to give you the most coverage you can get for the form of care you want, home care, assisted living, skilled nursing, memory care, whatever is necessary and what the person wants to choose. All right. We, uh, we were talking about what types of policyholders can benefit from this. Uh, what kind of policyholders? And, you know, we were talking about long-term and was a whole life. And, you know, there's so many different kinds that people can pay into. That's right. There's, there's you know, there's, there's term life insurance, which a lot of people buy. There's and explain, because a lot of people really still don't understand what term life insurance is. Term life is, is, as the name implies, bought to cover you for a specific term, a period of time. You can get a 10-year, a 15-year, a 20-year. And so you have coverage at, at a certain price, which is usually the, the least expensive monthly premium amount, a term life policy, for the most coverage. Uh, but it's for a specific period of time. So let's say you know somebody buys one at the age of 40. And by the age of 60, when they know all their kids have grown up, gone to college, and moved on, the policy then expires. They had it for a 20-year term to cover them in case something were to happen. A universal life policy or a whole life policy are permanent forms of insurance. They, they will stay with you regardless of, of, of how long you live. Uh, and, and they will build up cash value. So as you're paying in with premiums, there's a... a amount that builds up in a policy, which is known as cash surrender value. And some people, let's say with a $100,000 policy, maybe they end up with $5,000 of cash surrender value. Some people will say, I'll take that 5000 and walk away from my policy. Others, families we work with, will say, you know what, I'd rather convert it and get a higher amount so I can apply it towards my long-term care. Uh, also, group life policies, people who may have taken a policy out at work and now they've retired, and many will keep those policies. That also is a form of life insurance that can be converted to pay for long-term care. Oh, see, I didn't even realize that. I'm not I'm, because a number of people over the years have had group life policies because right. of work, and in some companies, almost in in a, in a sense, force you to uh, take those policies out. 
Yeah, it's it's like an automatic part of your mm-hmm. compensation package. And then when you retire or leave, you have the option to take it with you, and many people do. Yeah, but a lot of people don't know they can. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing. People have people. Want, if you have a group life policy through an employer, a union, anything like that, you can take it with you. You know, you have to fill in, you have to file the paperwork and take over the the policy and the premium, but you're going to get it at a very low cost uh, and be able to hang on to that for the rest of your life. Wow. Okay. See, you just made me smarter. Uh, uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna take a break, and we're gonna wrap up with Chris Oristis when we come back. He's senior healthcare expert and CEO of Life Care Funding. You stay tuned. We'll be right back with more conversation about today's hottest topics right after this short break. This. And now, let's join Maggie Linton on Sirius XM Urban View, Channel 110. Well, welcome back. We're continuing to talk about long-term care with Chris Aristas, senior health care expert and CEO of Life Care Funding. Uh, Chris, we've got Wanda in New York. Go ahead, Wanda. My call. My question is concerning a small life insurance policy. I took out um, several years ago, it was very minimal, and the company from that life, the company kept trying to convert it and did different things, but I never signed off on it. So I kind of don't know the status of it. All I know is um, I get dividends from that life twice a year. How would I go about figuring all that out? It's a Do policy you- that's still in effect that I can convert later on or whatever. Do you do you have a copy of the policy? I do not. The, you, I would say the first thing you want to do is if you have if you have one of those dividend statements, you want to contact the insurance company, tell them request a a copy of the original policy. They they okay. have it. You as the owner are entitled to it. They will send you either a copy of the policy or or a confirmation certificate of coverage. So you want to have that in hand, and from that, you'll, you you want to make sure you know what is the death benefit, what is any cash value that I have built up potentially in this policy. Um, from that, you'll be able to determine what you could do to convert it in the future. Again, it's not something you're going to want to convert until your your need for long-term care is immediate, but having that policy in hand – means you have a, a, an asset, a tool that you're going to be able to use when it comes time for long-term care, but you want to have a copy of it and make sure it's in hand so you know what you have. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Contact the insurance company. They will get. They will give you what, you what you're entitled to have. Thank you. And so often, like you were talking about, so many of the uh, uh, po- insurance companies have gone out of business or been bought up by others and things like that. It really is important to have the paperwork, isn't it? It is. It's, it's always amazing to us how many families we talk to that say, we know we have a policy, but we, we, you know, we've lost it. But even though you may not have a physical copy of it, you do still own it, and you should contact your, your insurance company and get a copy. Make sure you have it on hand. Everybody should have a file of you know, their will, um, um, you know, a copy of any insurance policies, copies of any any bank accounts. If you have if you have CDs, if you have a safety deposit box, people should have a file. I know it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but in case something happens with with either incapacitation, long term care, somebody's deceased, you're you're better off for all your family to have all your paperwork in a file where somebody knows where it is instead of putting people through trying to piece together like detectives what what you have. There are literally billions of dollars of unclaimed death benefits out there because somebody died and the family didn't even realize there was a hundred thousand dollar a million dollar life insurance policy sitting there that they lost track of yeah um, I'm the woman that I work with her um, mom passed away and 
lo and behold, it had to have been a year or so later that she found out that um, her mom still had a policy, like we were just talking about, group insurance uh, through another company that she didn't, she had no clue about. There was no paperwork or anything, and the company actually uh, contacted them for the yearly benefit or whatever the case may be, and that's how they found out about it. Right. They sort of stumbled into it. Yeah. So, and fortunate for them that they did. Exactly. Very fortunate because it wound up being able to pay for services uh, for her dad, uh, you know, because they were able to uh, cash it in. We've got another. Well, and, Go ahead. I was just going to say, and this really, you know, kind of, you know, as we as we're, as we're kind of getting to the end of the interview, this, this kind of goes back to the point that we that, that we always make, and that's to be prepared. Mm-hmm. You know, people need to do their homework. They need to be prepared. You can't just sort of ignore all this until you're in a crisis situation. Somebody's laying in a hospital bed, and then everybody starts looking at each other and says, well, do we have insurance? Do we, do, or, does anybody know what mom or dad really had? I, you know, he never talked about the assets or his bank accounts. Does anybody have access to anything? And you'll be surprised at how many people are completely, it's a mystery what their own family members, their own parents have to work with. And open up the dialogue. We have a call from Jason in New Orleans. Go ahead, please, Jason. Hey, how you doing today? Good, and you? Oh, I'm good. I'm glad glad the guest just said what he just said because me and my sister talk all the time about my parents. And um, when we try to talk to them about life insurance or policies, I mean, as you know, my mom, she get real irate. And um, my mom brother just passed, and it it, it, it turned out real ugly. You know, mm-hmm. money had to be borrowed from family members, which the family thought he had a policy. And it's like, you know, me and my sister just trying to get something together. I'm just trying to figure out what's a good way to get into stubborn parents. <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> Well, you know, that's such a great question, and, and it's really, a, you know, it's that dynamic that so many people face around around the country. It, it, number one, it's an unpleasant topic to talk about. People would rather be talking about, you know, the start of the NFL season than what's going to happen if you die or, 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 or are you prepared to go into a nursing home. It's just not a fun conversation, and people avoid it. Uh, but but, but they, they shouldn't, and they really, they really can't. You know, it's they owe it to themselves and to their family members to sit down and have that conversation and say, well, we just want to be ready. We want everybody to be protected, to be safe um, and, and, and to just have an open discussion. It isn't about trying to figure out your inheritance and how much money you're getting. It's really a conversation to be had that's in the best interest of, of your parent, your loved one. It's not about what you're trying to do for you. It's what you're trying to do for them. And I think if you approach it from that perspective, it's going to be received much better than some perception of, you know, you're trying to dig into their business to figure out what you have coming to you because you're waiting for mom to kick the bucket, which is not what you're doing. The other thing I might suggest is you you just use the example of your uncle uh, just passed away recently and they saw how much hassle and things that you had and go, we just don't want this to happen the same way with you two. And that might be another way, you know, sometimes the glare that's in the in their face might be something that is a wake up call. Yeah, if you have if you you know what, in today's day and age, most people inside their family can point to the experience of a loved one who had to go to a nursing home, <clears throat> who passed away and no one knew what to do. There's plenty of experiences that people can point to and say, let's not let that happen to you, mom or dad or, 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 or my sibling. Let's be prepared. Right. All right. Thank you, Jason. Good luck. Uh, we got Emmanuel in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can now. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I do concur with your, your guest uh, today. Uh, one of the things I did with my parents, I'm, I'm an investment advisor. I'm 43 years old. My parents, 67, 62. So uh, about three or four years ago, I went to my father. I said, Dad, if something happened to you today, where is your paperwork? And as a matter of fact, he took me to that location. It was interesting because it's so powerful what you guys say. My mom was so removed from that. She actually immediately got nervous just having that conversation of my dad passing away. And I tried to calm her and say, Mom, this is very important. If something happens to dad or you, we need to know where things are located. So 
fortunately, my dad is pretty organized, and uh, he's we've been taking care of the family, so those documents did place. And so, I same situation. I have an aunt, seventy three years old, and I said, and she only has one son, and she has a home that two homes paid for, and retirement plan, et cetera. And I said, Aunt Margaret, if if you die today, where's your paperwork? Do you have a will? She say what? And she's retired. I said, well, what are you waiting for? Because we're all going to go out one way or another. That's right. So, matter of fact, I, I called her every day that same week until she made an appointment with the attorney to get a will established for her son and for her family. But we, the ones that know better and prudent, I think we have to be commissioned to do more of this. And uh, just one thing, by being a professional, I said that could create a business of its own where people like me or your guests and other people that's a business opportunity for someone to go out to different homes and create a legacy plan uh, for families. Because most, most families probably don't even have a plan uh, if, if something like this come about. So you, that's you, know that, you know, that's a, you bring up a, a checklist. Point, I'll just say in terms right. of um, a, a business, there actually are companies online that you can subscribe to that, that offer – like an online virtual safety deposit box for all those kinds of records so the family can access them. Uh, I, I'd Google and look up um, those those kinds of potential services as well as having it hard copy. You could have it digital, encrypted, electronic, so that any member of the family could access it at, at when the time comes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. we got Daniel in New York. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh. We've got Daniel making no calls at this point. Uh, Daniel? Hello? Yes. Yes, go Hello? ahead, please. Hi, thank you for taking my call. No. Um, my grandfather passed away about 25 years ago. And according to my mother, he left a large sum of money in a bank up to her name. However, she has no documents of any of this. Now, she, went, she tried to find a bank. It's in Puerto Rico. Now, she tried to find the bank, um, and she went to a few of them, but they keep telling her the one document that she needs is his Social Security number, which she does not have. Now, is there any way uh, the gentleman on the show can, can guide me to where um, I can help my mother get this money? <clears throat> well, I would say this. If, if, if the missing ingredient is a Social Security number, there is a national Social Security database. Uh, every okay. Social Security number that's ever been issued in the history of this country is registered and, and in, you know, in federal holding. Um, you can petition um, Social Security to get that uh, Social Security number. Uh, you just you, you, what it would entail some significant paperwork verifying um, that your mother is, you know, the daughter of this person. Um, she would have to have her birth certificate. I'm sure there's there's some other paperwork involved to go through the verification process. But that Social Security number exists. If it were if it was issued, it exists. Okay. So I'll make sure I relay that information to us. Thank you again. All right. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we've gotten some good calls today. And uh, if you, again, let's reiterate about your uh, life funding, lifecarefunding.com, because again, people need to know that they can be taken care of. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, as we've seen over the course of, of our discussion and your callers, there's a lot of questions, uh, a, a lot of people who are trying to, they want to be prepared. They want to be able to take care of their responsibilities. They want to be independent financially. They want to, to, to be able to handle their long-term care needs. Um, what we're trying to do is help families through that process. It, it, those families with a life insurance policy, which, as you can see, there are a lot of people out there that have policies, and, and, and they're trying to figure out what to do with them, we provide an option to help them take that policy and turn it into a long-term care benefit um, that they can then use to choose the form of care they want, stay private pay, avoid having to do something like go on to Medicaid, um, and, and be in control of of their care, their future, not only for themselves, 
but for their families. We have a lot of good information on our website, lifecarefunding.com. There's a lot of good information out there online, on the Internet, through Google searches uh, that we really encourage people to read up on, do their homework. There's some great stuff out there that will help families better understand what they're dealing with. Um, and and our, our company and our website is one of those resources, and we're always looking forward to talking to families to answer their questions and help them through this process. And also, check your paperwork. That is probably the most important thing we can say. Find out what you're really covered for, and if you're not, then get some insurance that helps cover that. That's right. That's right. Check your paperwork. If you're missing the paperwork, get the paperwork. Keep it together. Keep it organized. Have a discussion among your family. Have a plan. Don't let. Don't wait until a crisis to start trying to do something. You, right. you, you, you know, plan and prepare when you're not in a crisis mode. Take your time. Do it right. Be ready for the future. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today, Chris. Once again, it's Chris Aristas. He is senior health care expert and CEO of Life Care Funding. You can find out lots more at his website, lifecarefunding.com. We hope to have you on again sometime soon, Chris. Oh, anytime. It was a real pleasure to be with you and to talk to your listeners. All right. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks also to Adele Coleman-Williams, Michelle Palmer, Executive Director of the Wentz Center for Loss and Healing, based here in Washington, D.C., and Robin Stocksdale's Bereavement Services Manager of Gilcrest Hospice Care, which is based in Hunt Valley, Maryland, and also to Carol Brody Fleet. Her book, again, is Happily Even After, and her uh, website is womeninstilettos.com. All contact information will be posted on my Facebook page, Maggie Linton Show. On Monday, need a job but still not getting past the first interview or not getting called at all? Well, advice is on the way. We have Stuart Taylor back again. He's an executive recruiter and president of Top Performers. Author and publisher Austin Camacho will discuss his upcoming seminar that will feature New York Times bestselling author Def- Jeffrey Deaver. An update on March on Washington will come from Mark Thompson, who's part of our family here at SiriusXM. My new email address for any topic suggestions or comments is Show at gmail.com. Once again, that's Show at gmail.com. And just a reminder, uh, we ha- Sirius XM is running a commemoration for Whitney Houston's 50th birthday. It's a day-long special, and it'll feature music from her six Grammy Award-winning uh, career, as well as personal memories from Clive Davis, family members, and more. It's on Heart and Soul, Channel 48. It's already on right now, started at 9 o'clock, and will run until 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. Once again, that's on Heart and Soul on Channel 48. So many thanks to my producers, Adele Coleman Williams and Adrian Stout. Have a blessed rest of day and weekend. Until next time, seek peace and spread lots of love. I'm Maggie Linton.